Um, my name is Daniel Liguero, and I will be the one uh, giving the tutorial. Uh, to give you a little bit more information about me, uh, I'm the CTO at a company called Nastip, where we provide a software as a service developer platform. Uh, we use Kubevela internally to, uh, as a part, uh, as a building block for that platform. And that is how I became interested in the project, how we started learning about OEM and Kubevela, and I am one of the Kubevela maintainers. My background basically is on big data technologies at the very beginning of my career. Then I moved into a streaming machine learning model, building platforms that enable you to basically run that. Uh, then I moved into edge computing, and after that, I moved into more of the developer platform area, right? Um, this is going to be, a, as I said before, an intro to Kubevela. If you have further questions or more detailed, specific questions that are outside of the topic of this tutorial, feel free to come by, by the booth. There is a CNCF booth. Uh, I will be there later after the talk, tomorrow also, so feel free to come by and just ask any question, right? So, uh, the agenda for today will be, uh, first of all, we will talk a little bit about what is the open application model, uh, what is Kubevela, identifying two different elements. Then we will move into creating a small cluster with kind to install Kubevela and start deploying our own uh, applications. We will go through basic operations with uh, the Vela CLI, Vela UX. We will go a little bit about the workflows that are automatically uh, available uh, in the applications. We will give you a brief description of how you can enable multi-cluster deployments and how you can integrate within a GigOps uh, environment. And finally, some extra context. After that, uh, any question that come by, I will be happy to, to answer and go through them, right? So for this tutorial, uh, this is the link uh, with the associated content. We will go through the elements of this repository. This is where the step-by-step -step instructions of how to get the clusters are located. So basically for this uh, tutorial, I will be switching in between the uh, code editor, the terminals, and things like that, right? So just uh, bear with me and we will continue through that, okay? So let's start first by explaining a little bit what is the open application model, because it's something that is quite related with Kubella, but sometimes it's, it gets easily confused, right? So the open application model is basically the specification on how you are going to express your own applications. The idea here is to provide a high level abstraction called application that will enable you to describe your application in a way that is agnostic from the elements that you have uh, as an infrastructure and as a deployment target, right? Uh, all information related with the specification itself is available at on.dev that will lead you to the GitHub repo that is where the actual spec is uh, available, right? And the community around OEM is the same community around Kubevela, right? So you can ask questions in both directions, both to the more on the specification side, more on the implementation and uh, how you make it run on top of Kubernetes. The open application model uh, uh, was born on 2019. It was uh, an effort by Alibaba and Microsoft initially. Uh, they uh, put, let's say, the first version on, on top of OEM. And the idea there was, as I said before, try to get an abstraction that is easier to work with and is abstracted away from the infrastructure, meaning we would like to have an application description that you can deploy on any type of infrastructure and on any type of cloud provider. If you switch between cloud providers, there shouldn't be a need, ideally, uh, that require you to change basically your YAML files to adapt it to the small details, nuances, uh, annotations, things like that, that are required when, when you switch basically between cloud providers. So the focus on this is about reusability of components and make it easier for people to understand what is going on on the system. So things uh, we will talk about uh, understanding the application status and things like that, this is highly related with the spec in itself, right? It is highly extendable by design. We will see some examples of how can you basically extend the specification to tailor it to your needs and to make the components make the things that you want actually within your company or your use case. And 
let's start for which is the problem that we are trying to address first, right? So we are here uh, because we love Kubernetes. We believe that this is the technology that we need to use to run our applications. But sometimes we tend to forget which was the time that it took for us to become proficient in Kubernetes enough to be able to run those workloads, right? The main difficulty right now uh, that we see is that uh, Kubernetes is difficult to learn for a lot of people. There is a huge effort in the Kubernetes community to make more tutorials, to make more content, to make this more approachable. But maybe there is also a complementary way of using another type of abstraction that is on a higher level in such a way that not everybody requires to go through those steps to learn all of this, right? So imagine uh, the idea around this is an analogy is the same as if you need to become an engine designer to drive a car, right? In Kubernetes, sometimes that happens. So this is a way of bypassing that and enabling a lot of other new users that are coming into our infrastructures that are maybe are not developers, are other type of users that will like to use the infrastructure, but maybe doesn't have the, the requirements of, of learning a new technology such as Kubernetes, right? We all know that Kubernetes work with a collection of low-level entities, and uh, I just created a small map uh, trying to relate the major ones, right? The main issue uh, with this type of entities is that at the end of the day, you are the one creating them individually, and you need to make in your head uh, the map basically of all of them being connected and working properly coherently. Sometimes this is where the errors appear, and this is one of the places where uh, this type of approaches, such as the OEM one, will fit in and will provide a way to automatically create all of those low-level entities uh, without you needing to make sure that you have proper annotations, you have properly labeled everything in between, so everything works together, right? So uh, one of the classic questions that we usually ask is, okay, is, it my, is my app running actually? Like, how can I see if one application, understanding application as a collection of services is running in a cluster, uh, we usually uh, need to go through each of the different components uh, remember to monitor them properly, label them, find out what is going on, right? The chain in here is that if we use things such as uh, OEM, we, instead of going with a bottom-up approach, which is a classic one of deploying the low-level instances, uh, you figure out in your head what is going on uh, at the top level, or you need to put other tools for you to do that, this is going top-down, right? We have an application that will generate a set of components on the cluster, and we will be able to reason about the status of an application. That's the main objective of all of this, right? So, as I mentioned, classically uh, what we do is uh, we just label everything and try to remember to label everything. Problems tend to appear when we start integrating with other elements. You may have a chart already there that put uh, another different type of annotations that is not the same that you want to standardize for your own cluster things like that, right? So this is uh, something that we need to have in the back of our heads to think about it, right? So as I said, basically OEM starts with a top-down approach and it's a way of having an application as the central entity in which we are going to reason about uh, on the system. Like if we want to check if the application is running, we will go to the application CRD, okay? So this is about OEM, the specification, what aims to do. Let's see now what is Kubevela and how does it fit in this picture, right? So Kubevela is basically the open application model runtime for Kubernetes. The specification in itself maybe in the future runs in other type of infrastructure, runtimes, anything you may think of. But right now, the only operator that exists is Kubevela and deploys stuff in Kubernetes. It's a CNCF incubating project. Uh, it has reached this stage just a couple of months ago, so it's uh, a quite nice uh, achievement for, for a young project. And it provides three main features. Uh, it supports multi-tenancy, so you can integrate and deploy Kubevela in a multi-tenant environment, and it will ensure that your role based control works as expected. It's uh, capable of deploying applications in multiple clusters, so you will be able to create kind of a control plane that manages a set of clusters, and applications get deployed into different clusters with different parameters, okay? We will see an example of this on this uh, particular tutorial. Uh, it is sensible. Uh, 
we want people to write their own components, trade extensions, so that you can basically tailor the use of Google and OEM to your particular use case. And that enables us basically to integrate with other projects. So from the point of view of Google and Center, you can see that this is the classical operator workflow, like you will get a CRD, which is going to be called application, you will process it, you will go through the different components, you will render the uh, low level entities, the classic deployments, uh, pods, services, etc. And you will orchestrate the deployment. This is something also that is included. Uh, we will see an example of how you can also create some workflows to manage the way that you want to deploy your application. And basically, as every other operator, it will continue to reconcile the state of the cluster, making sure that whatever is written on your application level gets translated into uh, low level entities. Okay? You have an add-on catalog uh, where the community has provided integration with different technologies of the Kubernetes ecosystem, and we will see one with the GitOps example, okay? Um, to give you a brief idea of uh, how long is this has been going, this is the timeline for both OEM and Kubevela. You see here that it started on 2019. Uh, it uh, was accepted mid-2021 into the CNCF, it has reached the incubating state, just as I said, mentioned before, a couple of months ago. And there is a steady adoption of the project uh, by many enterprise users, uh, many users around the world, especially in Asia. And it is getting bigger and it is getting much more mature each day and which is released. So with all of that said, uh, let us start going to the details of the tutorial and let's see what is an application, right? So the application, as I said, is going to be our top level entity. This is the one that we are going to work with. And as you can see, uh, basically an application is going to be composed by a set of components. Each one of them will have their own type. We will go into those details and you will be able to do things like applying traits to modify the behavior of the components. Uh, that will enable us basically to start separating also the way that we define the different responsibilities of who is doing what and who is defining which in the YAML, right? So you can have a development team producing a component, an application, and maybe if you are debugging an, an issue with that application, you may want to deploy that application with a trait that enables you to get a, a higher log level or things like that. We will see that later on, okay? So from the point of view of the components, the important thing here is that each component uh, has a type. You are able to define your own types. By default, there is a set of predefined component types that kind of resemble the classical uh, Kubernetes one. So it is more familiar to get used to it, right? Uh, web service, you can see it as an equivalent basically of a deployment plus a service. If you put this port and expose equal to true, that will automatically generate the service for you. And uh, one of the main uh, features of all of this is that components define properties. And this is a good thing because when you define your own component, you will be able to define the properties attending to your use case or the semantics within your company, for example. So this is a good way to limit basically which is the uh, exposed, let's say, API that you want to give to the user of that application or the one deploying it to limit what they can do with the application and to try to standardize and make it reusable, right? To put an example, uh, imagine that you would like to create a database component and maybe uh, for that purpose, you will only like to uh, provide three parameters. One could be which is the log level of the database, one could be uh, whether you want to trace slow queries or not, and another could be like whether you are working in a developer mode or not, and maybe that means, if it is true, I will only deploy a single replica with low resources because we are running integration tests, I don't know. Maybe if I set it to false, I will deploy the full database properly as I would like it to have it on production. So components basically allow you to limit what you want to do and you will be able to define actually which are the low level entities that are generated both in components and traits. Traits, as I said, is a way of modifying, let's say, or, or augmenting the functionality of a component. And classical examples of this are going to be things like 
adding, creating secrets, uh, mounting secrets into the containers, creating ingresses, registering our component into uh, observability tools, uh, creating sidecars, exporting logs, anything you can think of about modifying actually the component, you can do it with trace. And once you have it defined, you can reapply it and reuse it among the different components, okay? Next, uh, we have a concept called policy, uh, which you can think of as the same that you will do with trades, but on an application level. So if you want to make a configuration chain that needs to be applied to all components, instead of copying the same trade to every component, you will do it as a policy. And the policy will enable you to do things such as uh, defining which are general parameters, uh, if this related also to multi-cluster deployments, this type of configuration will become and appear as policies. Finally, the last element of an application is a workflow. And here you can see like, uh, let's think of a simple uh, workflow engine. And that will enable you basically to define how you want to orchestrate the deployment of an application. To put an example, you may think of, if we are working with a database component, you will maybe have in the workflow, the first step will be deploy the database, second step could be uh, preload the schema in the database, next you will deploy the final component, next you will send a notification, a notification through Slack. All of that can be achieved by means of workflows and workflow steps, okay? Everything, as I said, workflow steps, policies, traits and components is configurable and you can make your own and you can adapt it to your own use cases. For that, uh, you will write this type of uh, entity, a trade definition, a component definition. The uh, schematic, the template that will be applied is written in Q language. And you will be able basically to say, to define which are the parameters that you accept, uh, some context, some help on that, plus which are the outputs, which are the entities that you are going to generate <coughs> combined with the fact that you are able to make some coding in that template, like you have loops, you have uh, ifs, you have uh, the ability to create some uh, simple structures. So it is easy to manage all of this and define what you want to generate for your particular trade, uh, component, etc. One nice feature of this is that sometimes we are seeing that this can replace basically the need of re or writing your own operator. Like if you are just reading uh, an operator to limit the supposed properties, for example, uh, to make it easier for a user uh, to use a component or deploy an element into your system, you can use this approach to basically avoid the need to write your own operator. Kubella will take care of becoming this meta operator if you wish and will apply the trade for you or the component for you. So, with that said, uh, let's go now more into the hands-off part of the tutorial, and let's start with the very beginning, which is installing Kubebella, okay? Uh, for that, uh, we will do two things. We will create a kind cluster, and then we will install Kubebella on it. All of these steps are on the GitHub repo that I just uh, pasted before, uh, and we will follow the first document, which is installing Kubebella. Bear in mind that for the tutorial as a whole, we will be using two terminals at the end. So get one terminal, I'll call it terminal one uh, for now, and that one will be the one in which you need to deploy all of this, okay? So I will give you a couple of minutes to get you started and to deploy the cluster, and then we will continue, okay? So we are following this particular document here of installing Google.
Well, this is stalling. Uh, you will see here that these are, there are two alternatives actually to stall Kubebella. One is just using the kind cluster that you already probably are familiar with. The other one is uh, with Bella D, which is a tool created by the community. We are not using this today basically because the second scenario of the multi-cluster approach becomes significantly difficult. Uh, basically by the way that the networking is uh, done with uh, Bella D. But this is a tool that you can use if you want to spawn, let's say, a starting cluster and you want to use that to create then other clusters, uh, Bella D is a good tool for that. Uh, it works well in AirGap environments also. If you want to start uh, deploying applications into other clusters. Maybe you want to test Kubebella just uh, without installing the operator in a cluster, uh, that could be a good approach, like having this Bella D or, or kind if you wish. Deploy Kubebella in here, point that uh, deployment to the other cluster so that the application can deploy it in the other way without interfering with the workloads that you already have in terms of operators that are launched in the cluster. Once everything is ready and the CLI is installed, you should be able to uh, basically execute Bellacom and that will give you the list of uh, elements into the, into the system, the component definition, right? <laughs> Could happen. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, I did it yesterday, it took a minute or two, but uh, it ended well, so <laughs> I was hoping uh, connectivity will help us. Let me know uh, if, if it continues crashing or it's not able to download it. Uh, if everyone can also provide kind of a feedback, you give me a thumbs up, I can continue. <laughs> but I would like to get this uh, ready. Is everybody having issues downloading the images? Yes? Okay. <coughs> well, it, sh it should be doable. I mean, I'm also using ARM. I'm running on ARM, basically, so uh, you should not have any issues with the... Uh, like all of these can create and so on should be available also for for Mac. Okay. Okay, let's give it one minute. Uh, if not, I will continue. Uh, so at least it gets recorded and you can reproduce it later on. So while this gets installed, <laughs> let's, con yeah? <Okay. laughs> let's continue a little bit. Uh, so basically you will have the Bella CLI, which is the tool kind of equivalent of Cube Control, things like that. It is also available as a CRU plugin, I think. So you may want also to check it out. Uh, basically it's a way to interact with the cluster 
through the bell abstractions. Uh, if you want to receive the information about what is going on in the system through a standard cube control, uh, for example, you want to get the component definitions, the equivalent of bell and comp is going to be like uh, cube control on the namespace bell assistant, which is where the definitions are stored initially, and uh, get the components, which are the CRD that is just being created for that. It's important to mention that uh, you can create your own uh, definitions and you can deploy those in your own namespace. So definitions are not, let's say, uh, cluster level entities. They work by namespaces. So if you want to test something out, you can just test it on a particular uh, namespace and it wouldn't affect the rest of the cluster. So uh, moving on to the basic operations in here, uh, the next part of the tutorial is starting to deploy the hello world, let's say, and we are going to deploy uh, a basic OEM application. To do that, the first thing that you are going to do is execute this command, which is bella-env, and that will create an environment, which in fact is just a namespace, but if you check like which are the labels, you will see that it's been labeled. Um, this one. It has some labels, so you can differentiate between the environments that you want to use from the Bella point of view and the others, okay? But it's just a namespace. Um, once you do that, you can deploy applications with uh, Bella app. And what will happen in here is that the operator will take care of the definition of the application. If we take a look to the application, this is just the simplest uh, application I was able to think of. Uh, so you can see that, first of all, we have the CRD uh, for the application. We have components. Uh, we are using the web service component. The web service component resembles, as I said before, a deployment. Uh, we are going to deploy engines, exposing uh, port 80. And we are going to create a gateway. We will create actually an ingress for that service. One that is uh, done and available, uh, you will be able to uh, get to the to engines through this command. Okay. Um, yeah. You have here, just in case somebody has issues with the ports that are now occupied and things like that, uh, the first uh, kind cluster has redirections to port 80 and port 443, so if anybody has uh, something running already, just be aware that you may need to change the port later on. And for the second clusters, we are going to use 8080 and 8443, okay? So, um, so, that, that got deployed uh, with Bella. Uh, if we go now through uh, the Kubernetes standard API and check what is going on, you will be able to see, whoa. <laughs> okay, it's happening. Uh, the same that <laughs> you were mentioning before. You will be seeing this when it is able to pull the... Okay. Okay, we will continue. Uh, whenever <laughs> internet wants to collaborate with us, uh, it will get deployed. We all trust Kubernetes, right? So uh, <laughs> let's continue on all that. But as I said, uh, you will be able to access the same elements through Cube Control as usual. Okay, it's just that we are using the application. If we get the app, you will see here, like it's telling us that it's not healthy because the image is not full. But this healthy and status is being calculated based on the status of the different components that are linked to the application. So if something fails, one of the components fails, you will get uh, immediately a change in the status of the whole application. So it is easy to detect basically if something is working or not. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's the expected uh, one, as you may think. Uh, 
to delete application, you can use Bella delete and you will issue the, the name of the, of the application. Every time you deploy an application with Bella, it will tell you like how you are able to get the logs, uh, get a, con uh, a, bash, a shell into the container, get them points, etc. That wouldn't work because the container is not uh, launched, uh, but anyway. I hope sooner, more than later, it gets deployed. Oh, yeah, <laughs> okay, you are correct. <laughs> okay, cool, <laughs> I was not suspecting that. Okay, <laughs> time to move to another registry probably. Um, so, uh, <laughs> let's imagine that the image actually is available. <laughs> we'll try to see if anybody else is. Uh... Yeah, that's true. Let's connect it, at least you will be able to see it. Try to bypass the back off. Okay, okay, we'll use the local host both, thanks. <laughs> so, um, yeah, let's continue with this. Um, so, basically, you want to delete the application, you can just execute uh, this Bella delete. Uh, as I was telling before, if you want to check out the logs, you can just go in here and copy this, and you will get the, the logs from endings. Um, you want to check what is created, you can do it by labels. Uh, and yeah, the, there is a dry run, like this is something that is getting improved by a lot by the latest revisions of the community. If you are in here, uh, I don't remember exactly. This, this whole dry run and there is option even for the I run to analyze the different traits and how they apply and all the components. So you can uh, check, you want to check or pre-check, let's say what is going to be generated, you can do it with this dry run, okay? Sorry? Oh, yeah, because uh, there are some timeouts actually involved in the application, uh, in the workflow engine. So it's telling you basically that I was unable to complete the deployment step on the required time. That's what it's uh, basically aiming to, to tell you about the, the, the app. It said that it's uh, ready, it's not f uh, healthy. Uh, probably in the next run, uh, it will recheck itself. If not, uh, we need to, to take a look to this from the community side. Thanks. So, uh, yeah, I was saying, uh, you can tell the logs, uh, you can uh, delete the application.
and I will delete uh, everything. Uh, let's try to put the driver in a sample. Uh, if you issue the dry run with the, with the same application definition, you can see here like this is uh, what is intended to create in the cluster. And you will see that everything gets annotated by the application name and the parent component. Uh, there's one limitation with the component names. So the name that you give cannot be uh, duplicated in the same, must be unique within the same namespace but it gets uh, annotated by everything, basically. So if you want to get like all resources from Kubernetes with a specific label, you can do it by application name, which is typically the easiest way uh, possible to get it. Okay, but yeah, that is just, uh, just in case somebody misses it, this is just dry run. Instead of saying app, just uh, change the command to dry run, okay? Okay. Uh, Let's continue a little bit. Uh, so, uh, well, we have gone through these, checking the status and so on. Uh, next move now to uh, uh, an example with at least two components. Uh, that's the second example with the uh, uh, Deploy Complex app on the tutorial. In here, uh, I actually put the sample that you asked for, like uh, how you get all the components in Kubernetes with a particular label, you will get this. Uh, this is the expected output from the next exercise, right? So let's move in here. Deploy. Okay. Does not seem to be working. This is another view of well, what is going on, on on the cluster by component and by application. This is also a nice way of uh, looking at applications. Uh, they will be also divided by clusters and things like that, so you can easily check them out. If we go into the details of what is going on at the workflow level, uh, there's a typo. There may be another typo I miss. <laughs> okay, let me check this out. So let's take a look to the application that we are trying to deploy. Uh, this is just the classic Hello World WordPress uh, plus MySQL component. In here, you can see things like, uh, apart from exposing ports and things like that, you can set up the environment variables. You can use a lot more traits that are predefined in the system, such as service binding, for example, to mount secrets or more config maps as environment variables. Uh, you have storage related traits to set up the, the storage for you. Uh, in particular, this one, take this as an example. I'm not telling everyone to store passwords in plain text uh, on GitHub. Uh, it's just a way of uh, creating examples uh, of data for 
config maps and secrets directly through the tray, okay? So, okay. So let's continue with uh, the other one, which is the dependencies. And dependencies is a way of saying like uh, how you want to orchestrate the deployment of the application, basically to try to mitigate these container restarts because other dependent services downstream are not available at the moment when we deploy the application first. So first option that we have is embedded with the component definition, uh, specification. You may would like to use this depend on, uh, which is at the same level as the component name. Uh, in that way, you can link dependencies in between components. It's probably not the best way to do it, but uh, it's a way to start with. Uh, as you can see here, uh, it's just saying like WordPress is dependent on uh, MySQL. And if we deploy this application and check the status of, of it, um, you will be able to see at some point like uh, the workflow being stopped because it's waiting for the other one to be available. Okay, right now everything is preload, so. Uh, okay. Okay, we'll see here uh, a little bit more information about this with Bella VX, which is coming right now. Bella UX is uh, a community add-on, so you can get a nice graphical interface <coughs> to work with uh, Kube Bella. You want to offer this uh, more in the place of you are building your own uh, developer platform. So to install this Bella UX, you just go to the next item on the list, and that will get you basically into, uh, let's see, Related to the add-ons, there is a catalog of add-ons, uh, which were kind of, uh, you can think of as a marketplace kind of thing, where you can submit your own add-ons and you can also use your own uh, uh, catalogs for that. Uh, they will enable different integrations from Google to other places. Uh, Bella UX is one add-on, but there will be add-ons for things like Argo, Flux, uh, Grafana, Backstage, things like that are already integrated as components or traits within the Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, let's see, does this deploy? Give it some time to deploy everything. Let's go through the second one. Uh, the password, the default password is on here and the default username is in there also.
So in this way, you will be able basically to go through the different environments, uh, the ones that we just created for this uh, scenario, pipelines and applications will be deployed in here. Okay, so let's see. So uh, yeah, let's deploy this and let's deploy something with a workflow so we can see it on the Vela UX if it's picking up. So application workflows, as I mentioned before, is just an easy way to orchestrate the deployment of applications. So they are composed by as workflow uh, step definitions and there are also many of them available from the community. To do that, uh, you will need to deploy this uh, WordPress with uh, workflows application. Okay. You can see here the application now that is being getting deployed. And uh, this is the way that the information is being shown. You can have here information about the um, workflow that is being created and how it is being orchestrated. In this case, what we are trying to simulate is application being registered to a discoverability service. So the workflow in itself, if we take a look to it, is just we have WordPress as before, we have uh, MySQL as before, we have another echo server just to tell you like what is being getting as an HTTP request. And the workflow that we have associated to this uh, instance of WordPress is just, first of all, let's deploy the, this fake discoverability uh, service, then we are going to deploy MySQL, then we are going to deploy WordPress. After that, we will send a notification to a webhook that is going to be our uh, discoverability service. And finally, we will print a message on the status. Uh, status in uh, OM applications are also configurable. So whenever you write your own trade or component, you can also specify what you want to see on the status. So things like, for example, if you want to expose something as an ingress, the status of that application can point you actually to which is the URL that you need to access to get to that uh, deployment. If you check out uh, here, you can also get like the view, the Kubevela Kubernetes view and equivalence, uh, something that was asked uh, before. You can see it here graphically, like what is being generated. Uh, you can see the different elements that are associated with the application and you can also get the logs from the application. In here, if you take a look to this, uh, this is the discoverability service. Uh, what it's showing up basically is by default, if you don't specify anything on the notification uh, workflow step, it will send the whole application definition to it. So you can see here like, hey, this is what was received because it was deployed, basically. Okay, so yeah, just take a look to uh, the workflows. Uh, as I said before, they are quite useful. They are not intended to become like a significant workflow engine, but for smaller things, it's a good way to start with it. So next, um, we have from that already. Uh, application workflows. We've done that. And now let's enter into the multi-cluster area, which is something that is also quite interesting, right? So this type of approach, uh, right now, what we have done up until now is basically have Kubevela deployed in a cluster and the applications are going to create elements in the same very cluster that we are deploying Kubevela. So we are just using one cluster, right? This method, what it does is moves you into the position of having this cluster, this cluster one, 
as a control plane of other clusters. And there are many different ways in which you can join different clusters to Kubevela. From the point of view of the applications, what you will find are policies that allow you to define which is the target cluster for a particular application, component, etc. Okay? If you want to take a look to more specific details, check out the topology policy. You will have a lot of uh, samples in there to make, for example, things such as, I want to deploy this application in this cluster with this configuration applied to it, but in that other cluster with another type of configuration. You can do that uh, by means of this topology policy. The way it works, uh, there are two ways. There is a connector uh, with the open cluster management, so you can use that uh, interface, those gateways, to behave as a pull-push uh, mechanism to I set up the elements in some place, the target cluster will pull them and execute them, or you can do it the other way around, which is the simplest way, let's say, that we are going to showcase today, which is this uh, control plane will actively communicate with the other cluster and will push the uh, applications in there. So to do that, uh, let's go into the next uh, document, the next step, which is about multi-clusters. And I will switch to it because uh, we will need to set up some stuff for that. So before we go into all the installation steps, uh, well, maybe let's start with installation steps and then we... As you can see here, it says on terminal two. So be aware that you are going to be working with two terminals and there are going to be two QF config files uh, actively working in different terminals. So I label this uh, terminal one. This is going to become terminal two, okay? Well, this is happening, uh, as I said before, what we are going to do is create a cluster that we are going to register with the name manage. And what we intend to do with all of this is to have a basic engine application that gets deployed into the other cluster. What it will happen is that application entities, the application CRDs, are going to appear on the control plane while the pods, deployments, etc., will appear in the other cluster. taking some time now. So basically to uh, continue this while this is uh, working, what we have seen so far, to remember you what we are here and we, what are we talking about, uh, the major change with uh, the Kubel approach is that we are going to start using applications and we are following a top-down approach instead of a bottom-up approach, which is the classical one. That enables us basically to start getting more users into our infrastructure. And this is an exercise sometimes of putting you, uh, instead of having, let's say, our hat of, we are comfortable working with Kubernetes, testing on other people that may not need to be required, may not need to be a requirement to learn Kubernetes to make their jobs efficiently. Like, for example, we are seeing more and more data scientist teams that have needs of infrastructure. They would like to run their Jupyter plus TensorFlow plus any other uh, machine learning tooling. 
on top of the infrastructure that we manage and provide, but with this type of approaches, we are enabling them basically to have application that they can go to a catalog, deploy a Jupyter Plus TensorFlow, and we will take care of how this, this is running in Kubernetes. We can monitor them with the standard tools, but the final user that is the one deploying the application doesn't need to go through that piece. Yeah, so. Yeah, so that, that's a good question, and this is one of the classical questions when we start talking about this. Uh, the issue with Helm charts, you can see like twofold. Like, first of all, managing charts and creating charts, once they start getting bigger, it becomes quite complex quite easily. Uh, and second of all, is that charts. Uh, we are still going through the need of understanding all the Kubernetes environment to create a Helm chart and to deploy it. So the difference in here is that we are on a layer on top. You can argue that you can create a Helm chart that actually deploys this application because at the end of the day is another CRD. But the way this is intended to be used is more on the side of this is an abstraction that is on a top level and instead of working with the classical low level entities from Kubernetes, to work on top. It's the same as people when they, they ask about Customize. Customize is a nice tool uh, to create your YAML files, but from an outsider point of view, it's quite difficult to get into it because it actually is intended to be used or classically it's been learned as you learn Kubernetes sometimes. So I think the barrier in here or the entry barrier is whether you assume that the people deploying applications are proficient in Kubernetes or not. That's the, that's, basically the place in which I think this type of developer platform, if you wish, uh, actually provide you with a benefit, which is like somebody doesn't need to learn the whole stack to be able to deploy applications. I don't know if that makes sense for you. Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> sure. Yes. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I understand your, your point. So the case of the ingress, uh, the difference between having a classical ingress and having, let's say, a trade is uh, the moment you start getting abstraction uh, details away from the user. So for example, an ingress trade could be just as simple as saying, this is the ingress, this is the port, this is the path, this is the rewrite path, and the domain, for example, right? Uh, the operator that takes care of that ingress could be the one actually saying, hey, I'm deploying in this particular cloud provider and that ingress needs to have these annotations. Whereas if we use the standard approach that we are using right now, you as a developer needs to provide sometimes like, this is the ingress for AWS, this is the ingress for Google, this is the ingress for Azure. That complexity from, for example, from the cloud provider back to the developer gets removed if you put that in charge of, if the platform team, for example, is the one tweaking uh, or configuring that ingress trait, you could be one saying like, hey, that ingress trait in this cluster gets translated into this, you know? That's where I see uh, an advantage of using this type of partition. Like, you are not putting, for example, cloud uh, particularities into the application. It remains kind of cloud agnostic, unless you want to have components that doesn't make it cloud agnostic. Sure. <laughs>
So, I think it, it depends on the uh, company by company, right? But you're correct. I mean, this actually goes into the movement of these uh, developer platforms kind of thing, right? And these developer experience groups, uh, whatever you want to call it, depending on the company, they are called something or another. The thing in here is that uh, it depends on the team at the end of the day. Like, there are some teams that are quite proficient with Kubernetes, work well with Helm Charts and low-level entities. They have all the knowledge and they work perfectly on the day-to-day -day basis. The problem comes when you want to add a new member to that team and you need to get them to the same level as the other people. So giving these templates to developers is something that we all do, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, this is kind of a method to make it simpler for them to maybe just say like, hey, I put, create a container for my application, I'm able to deploy it, I don't need to get into all the particularities to be able to do that, you know? That's where I see the, the, the advantage. We will continue a little bit. Uh, I'm happy to answer any question now or after the talk of tomorrow. So, uh, okay. So we were working with a multi-cluster approach. Uh, what we are doing in here in Terminal 2 is just uh, creating, extracting the QF config file for this managed cluster, uh, basically because we need to modify it a little bit so that networking works correctly from the other kind cluster, okay? So, Let's get the IP address, which is associated to this particular container. And you will need basically to modify the configuration file you have set up to this one. So before we move forward, uh, since the uh, default context for the QF config has changed because we have installed a new cluster, we need to go to terminal one and make sure that we are using still the QF config file that gives us access to the previous cluster, okay? To do that, uh, you can just get the kind uh, QF config and export it and in my particular configuration, you can see here on the right, which is the active uh, context and the active, uh, the default namespace for that configuration. When you have done that, the only thing that you need to do is to join the cluster. And joining means that uh, you will basically provide the QF config file to this uh, control plane, and you will be able to manage it from there. You should see something similar to this output with the IP that you need, uh, you get. And if you issue this uh, cluster list command, you will see now that you are able to access another cluster through a, a certificate, which is the one associated with the QF config file. After that, uh, let's deploy the simple engines uh, application and we will check out uh, what is happening in here. I think I forgot one step probably. We will see. Let's remove the other application just to avoid noise. So this is the remote deployment uh, element in here. Uh, if we take a look to the other cluster, you can see now that there is a QFCon uh, namespace that was not dead before. <laughs> If 
if you get the pods in the second cluster, in target cluster, you will see the pod of engines running. You will see uh, a deployment, but you wouldn't see an app in here because the app is actually maintained in the other place. So in this case, if you change the or modify the app on the uh, control plane cluster, uh, it will modify actually the deployment on the target cluster as you will expect, basically. Just to a little bit one more to show you more information about it. You can check out also through the UI if you want. is correct because I was on the other cluster. <laughs> this is on the control plane. <coughs> and as you can see here, it's just a, a deploy method with a topology applied, uh, targeting a cluster that you have registered with a name. You can have as many clusters as you want, as I said. Uh, if you want to actually work on this, check out the OCM uh, plugin because you will probably would like to go that way. So, Reaching that step, uh, next thing is about GitOps and how you can uh, enable Kubella to work with that type of environment. Uh, for that, in Terminal 2, <coughs> you will, uh, we will use the Flux CD add-on. And Flux CD provides us with two things. Okay, I will go through the slides, because if not, I will forget it. Um, so basically, it gives us two things. It gives us the ability to create these customized uh, entities, which are the standard CRDs that Flux reads to pull things from Git. Plus, it enables us to deploy Helm charts as components of our application. So through uh, the Flux <coughs> sorry, components, you will be able to do things such as the example in here, or imagine your application relies on Redis or any other components that you are actually deploying as uh, from Helm, you can do that by integrating it with Flux first and then creating a Helm uh, component. Just be aware that this type of integration is still a work in progress, so you may not be able to translate all the labels or apply all the labels that you would like from the application downwards to the final deployed elements from Helm, okay? But it's a nice way also to start testing out uh, Kubebella, if you already have your components at Helm chart, you may just want to check one, what will be, what will be the effort uh, migrating one application but relying on existing components to not require you to migrate everything at first, okay? <coughs> so, uh, the example I will show you today will be, uh, we will create an application. That application has a customized component in that component, we will specify the target uh, repo, and that basically will create an entity that that CRD will get processed by Flux, and Flux will go to the repo, they will find another application, and then the application will get deployed. So this is just a hello world on Flux and OEM, okay? So to do that, uh, once this is ready, let's see if it's finished. Yes. <clears throat> you will be able to deploy this GitHub application. <clears throat> and when it gets deployed, you will actually see this Git, Hello GitOps deploy a Hello App application, which is the one that is actually on the, on the same repo. So if you go here to the same GitHub repo, um, go into GitOps, this is the Hello GitOps application that we have deployed in the control plane cluster. As I told you before, it created a customized component in this target name space. It is pulling the same repo in itself it will be listening for changes every 30 seconds, just for the sake of examples. Uh, you can configure the branches, everything that you are used to do on Flux. And in this case, what will deploy is this Hello application, which is just another uh, Hello World example that gets deployed. So this basically ties everything together uh, and allows you to get integrations with a GitHub environment. Okay, so uh, 
just to finish this up, uh, mentioning again, like you have an add-on catalog. Uh, there are plenty of add-ons that are already available from the community and you can use them, contribute them if you wish to integrate with your own uh, component in there. Uh, it is also important to mention that uh, you can deploy Kubevela in multi-tenant environments. Uh, what will happen if you install Kubevela with these uh, parameters is that every time you will get an application submitted to the cluster, it will get labeled by the account, the identity that is submitting that application. And when the operator starts the deployment phase of the components that need to be created in Kubernetes, it will impersonate that entity so that every role that you have configured for that account will be enforced, basically. So this allows you basically to work with multi-tenant environments with the roles and the underlying error back that you have configured. It will work by default. And finally, there has been uh, a huge effort latest in the community uh, testing out the latest revision of Kubevela, seeing how much does it scale to which level and which resources do you need to run this at scale. And I would just like to put this as a reference, like if you are having issues deploying this and want to tweak and configure the operator in detail, there is a troubleshooting guide also on how to do it and how you can configure your cluster for that. Uh, for further information, just check out the OAM specification, uh, check out the kubela.io webpage. There is a bi-weekly meeting for both in English and Chinese. Uh, there are on alternate uh, weeks and feel free to attend the meeting and say something and contribute as, as you want. Uh, there is a kubela CNCF channel uh, on, the, on the CNCF official Slack. And you can check also the Kubevela GitHub repo, okay? And if you wish to learn more about Nautic, you'll go to our webpage, okay? And with that, I will leave some time for questions. Um, I hope that uh, you learned something and it was not too boring, hopefully. So thanks everyone for attending. Yes. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I, I show like probably like what you can achieve with all of this, but probably if you think of, I only have flags at the very beginning, I want to manage everything, all these traditions as anything, you are correct. You can have the, the flags and say, hey, this is the operators that I need in my cluster as any other prerequisite, install them, and then this, those are the applications, and just happen that those applications require this operator. You are perfectly correct. I just try to show like, probably a convoluted sample, but just to showcase like what you can do, basically. Thanks. Okay, cool. If, yeah. So basically, uh, there are two questions involved, I think. So let, let me think if I go those. So one is about naming of components. Uh, that was a community decision uh, because from the point of view of the spec, you would like to be platform agnostic even. So let's imagine that tomorrow there will be a version of Kubernetes that has replaced deployments with another thing. Uh, then web service will enable you to continue working with that without entering that detail. It's just a way of extracting. There could be better names, I agree with you, uh, but 
Anyway, those are the, the ones that they are. Uh, in case you want to deploy your own CRD, there are several approaches to do that. One, uh, which is not the recommended, let's say, uh, way, which is just to embed the Kubernetes entities as a component. You can do that. Apart from referencing components, there is a type, which is called uh, Kubernetes, that actually allows you to embed directly a, a Kubernetes resource if you would like to do it fast, and that's it. If you would like to offer these to uh, users, the usual way will be like wrap it in a component, and that component will enable you to set up different parameters that you would like to give to your users. That will be the, the way either by a component or by a trade or by a policy, depending on what that CRD does on your application, how it is related and how you think it must be approached. Sometimes there are people that can argue, you can argue both that something could be a trade or a component depending on the discussion, you know? So, it depends, but basically you have those two approaches, either embed it directly, which is not, let's say, the fancy, pretty way or the OEM way, but you can do it, or create your own components and wrap the CRDs that you need. Yeah, so, uh, so th there was a discussion on the community side of whether you actually define the spec first and then you make the implementation afterwards of you work on the implementation and then port it back to the spec. Uh, the decision was to try to be flexible and to try to be cautious about adding something to the spec without knowing like how much does it fit actual use cases. So if you take a look to an application from the spec point of view and from the Kubella point of view, workflows doesn't appear on the spec point of view by now, but they will because if have been checked, let's say, or, or proven that people actually like to use them, they have been confirmed, so they are going to be ported back to the, to the spec. But the idea is that, uh, OEM as a specification defines the minimum and then every implementer of that uh, specification should at least provide those, uh, those constructs, if you wish. Others, such as the one that we are using right now with Kubebella, uh, the idea is to be able to test ideas without compromising the whole discussion on the spec side because sometimes it's easier to say, hey, this is a standard right now. Yeah, but maybe in a couple of months you discover that it was not such a good idea. So given that the specs should move probably at another pace, the discussion on the community was, uh, that was the, the decision basically taken. Like, let's consider the spec as the minimum that you need to implement, but let allow uh, uh, runtime to give more things because we want to test out uh, ideas. The workflows are an example of those, like, there was some discussion around where does it fit and the application, whether they are embedded or the application, whether they actually are able to manage other applications. There is a growing effort in that, and probably you will see, apart from applications, workflow as a top-level entity also coming into the spec later on on the version. But the whole approach from the community side was, let's try to build both at the same time, but let's not make the error of putting something written on a stone and spec if we have not tested out. Thanks. How about versioning? Let's say you have a spec. Mm -hmm. You want to have enough versioning. How you have to do it? So I, I think versioning works as any other time, uh, the same versioning as you are doing with deployments and things like that. So from the point of view of the of the app is just another CRD. So it will get revisions on the modification. You can roll back between revisions. You can uh, configure Kubella to see how much you want to roll back, uh, how much history you would like to store and things like that. So it's the same management that you will have. Okay, thanks everyone again. Uh, um, if you have any further questions, just come by here or uh, later to the booth.
and I will be happy to answer and talk about anything you want. Uh, the booth uh, is uh, K27, is like on the farther side from here. <laughs> like just keep walking, keep walking, uh, you will pass the whole sponsors uh, things, and then if you pass to the next, uh, I don't know, the next building, uh, you will find just in the middle, those are where the CNCF booths are, and you will have all the projects that are part of the CNCF, some of them are all day, some of them are just, you need to check out the schedule, but uh, there are a lot of people there. Okay, thanks again.